That's what I want to preach today. I want to preach that question. Why, wherefore didst thou doubt? Father, bless us now as we preach the word of the Lord in Jesus' holy name. May we do no, do no damage to the gospel, but preach that which becometh sound gospel and doctrine. In Jesus' name, amen. Wherefore didst thou doubt? This is the question that begs to be answered. Got to answer it. We got we to gotta, we gotta get the implications of it because we're living in a changing world. The mores in society are shifting. And um, it is the will of the enemy to turn us away from biblical Christianity. To get you to doubt God. If, if you are not here Thursday night, you need to listen to Thursday night's teaching entitled Life Without God. It is, there are those who have a vested interest to get us to think outside or without the scripture. And it is the will of God that we include scripture in our thinking. When people think and reason and operate without scripture. People operate without God. And the scripture that I'm referencing is the Bible. All right? This question is similar to the question that Paul asked the saints at Galatia. He asked or said to them, he said, you did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? Uh, what happened? What did you hear? What did someone say to you that prevented you from continuing in God's truth? He said, I do want to say this to you. This is Galatians chapter 5, verse 7. In the 8th verse, he said to them, he went on to say, This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. He says, whatever they said to get you to turn from God, that persuasion, that doctrine, that way of thinking did not come from the Lord. Let me tell you something. You don't outgrow the Bible. Don't you let people make you think that the scriptures are things for little children and for the unwashed and the uneducated. And now that you are an adult and you've, you've been to school and you've learned a few things and you've traveled, now you no longer need the truth of God because you've been exposed to other things. You've heard from other people. You've heard other doctrines and other theories and theorems. And you've been exposed. So now you don't need God's word. Well, that persuasion. Whoever the devil used to convince you that you don't need the word of God, that person was not operating under the spirit of the Lord. From the time one is born to the time one dies, one needs the Lord and the scripture and the truth of God's word. Paul even said one time to the saints at Galatia, and I've felt this way on occasions. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 6, Paul says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that calleth you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. I often marvel at how easy it is for Satan to beguile some to talk people out 
of their relationship with the Lord. It's, 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 it, uh, it's amazing how little it takes to get a person to stay home. To decide they don't want to praise the Lord anymore. I'm not going to participate. My feelings are hurt. I'm not sure if I want to attend church anymore. It doesn't take very much at all. Paul says, I marvel. And the reason he marveled is that he knew what he had taught them. See, some are not living according to what they've been taught. Because you know, I know what I've taught you. See, if you decide to go... Uh, uh, LBGTQ from here you didn't learn that here now you can do what you want but you didn't learn that here you didn't, guys you didn't learn here that there can, can be a degree of legitimacy to a voice in your head telling you that you are a woman you didn't learn that here if there is uh, a force or something or the Bible says believe not every spirit, a doctrine, a thought, a reoccurring thought, that biblical Christianity is not the way. And perhaps you need to look to other horizons to find a savior from elsewhere. You didn't learn that here. So if you're able to go in that direction, I marvel. I'm, I'm stunned that you would go in that direction because you didn't learn that here. Paul says, uh, uh, Paul was amazed at the Galatians' defections from the gospel of grace. To reject the gospel's message is, to re is the same as rejecting God himself. The question that the God of the Bible asked Judah, the southern kingdom, through the prophet Jeremiah rings true. God says in Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 5, Thus saith the Lord, what iniquity have your fathers found in me, that they are gone far from me and have walked after vanity. That is, they now serve idols and have become vain. They've become idolaters. God even, God even questioned whether or not there was some shortness or some deficiency on his part. He said, what iniquity have your fathers found in me? You know, how, God said, how did I fail you? I'm, I'm the Lord. Where did I go wrong? What, what uh, didn't I do that would make you go serve, leave the Christian church and become a black Muslim or a white Muslim? Why would you leave the Christian church and become a Buddhist? What do you mean uh, that you're now an atheist? What do you mean? I'm not quite sure uh, about my feelings. I'm not quite sure about Christianity anymore. What do you mean you're not sure? What shortcomings have you discovered in God? What caught your eye is the question. What, or who caught your eye? That's, that's probably more uh, Kaepernick's situation. That Muslim woman he got caught up with made him change gods. She must have been made of something else. Uh, what or who distracted you? Uh, what or who caused you to doubt the God of the Bible? Back to the question, when, when, what caused Peter to sink? Are you with me? The word translated doubt carries the meaning of Standing uncertainly at two ways. Let that sink in. Standing 
uncertainly at two ways. Standing uncertainly at two ways. Peter started out with great faith, but ended up with little faith because he saw two ways instead of one. See, when he first got off the boat, he saw one way. Let me come to you, Jesus. Bid me. Command me to come to you. He saw one way. The only way he could get to Jesus was to walk on the water. The waters were too strong for him to try to swim on them. So the only way he could get to Jesus was to walk. So he asked Jesus, are you praying for me? Let me come to you. But while he was on his way to Jesus, he began to see something else. Regardless of your station in life, you must maintain, you must develop and keep a single-minded pursuit of Jesus Christ. The believer's commentary said this, said the Christian life, like walking on the water, is humanly impossible. It can only be lived by the power of the Holy Spirit. As long as we look away from every other object to Jesus only, we can experience a supernatural life. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. You've got to keep your eyes on the Lord. But the minute we become occupied with other with ourselves and with other with our ourselves, excuse me, and our circumstances, the moment the cares of this life gets the better of us. We began to sink. Then we must cry to Christ and ask the Lord for divine restoration and enablement. Second Timothy 2 and 4 says, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. You got to know how to keep things in their proper place. And always let the main thing be the main thing. And the main thing in the life of the believer is the pursuit of Jesus Christ. Our text takes place around 3 a.m. in the morning. Actually, between 3 and 6 a.m., just before sunup. And it had been, my brothers and sisters, a very, very, very long and fruitful day. The day began with Jesus having heard of the murder of John the Baptist. It didn't happen on that day. Chapter 14 records it, but... Uh, verse 3 tells us, for Herod had laid hold on John. This is an excursion. It's going back in time, teaching what had transpired. And how John was framed, John the Baptist was framed by Salome, uh, Herodias' daughter. This was a messed up family. Herod Antipas was dating his brother Philip's wife. Now, the earth is the home, I was thinking about this the other day, of 8 billion plus people, approximately. A good 5 billion of them are women. Out of the five, I just wouldn't want my brother's wife. 
I feel like the pickings are much too varied to have to choose. Let's see, go past this billion. Past that. Her. That's messed up. And then her, her, the, the woman, Herodias, she was no good. And she told uh, the preacher, John the Baptist must have been a member of Upper Room because he preached things that offended people. There were many Essenes in the days of John. There were many preachers. But only John said to Philip, it is not lawful for you to have your brother, said to Herod, it's not lawful for you to have your brother Philip's wife. Right. Now, what John said was true. Do you not know you can tell the truth now and people get mad? I told, I told you all the other day, it's no longer a sin to be a homosexual. The new sin is to be homophobic. That's, that's the new sin. The new sin is to disagree. It used to be to, to live in an immoral way was a sin. Now it's a sin to say something about it. Folk will get mad with you and accuse you of being a hater for, for agreeing with God on the issue of human sexuality. John the Baptist uh, said, it's not right. Herodias got mad and told her daughter, uh, my husband, his birthday is coming up. Now, we don't know whether it was his birthday when he was actually born or birthday uh, as to when he was, became the teacher. Both days, when he was appointed or born, would be called that person's birthday. And so they had this great big celebration, and on his birthday, Herod was inclined to grant the people a favor. A prisoner or someone could be released, or he would do something grand. So Herodias got with Salome, um, her daughter. And uh, th this girl was, was probably, at the most, 12 to 14. Uh, but to entertain her stepfather, she did a lap dance. She did, I told you it was a messed up family, a, a erotic dance. Now what, what father would even tolerate something like that? That's, that's unconscionable. Praise the Lord. I'm a dad. I'm a dad. I'm a granddad. I am a uncle. I have nieces and nephews. What normal person would tolerate something like that? And so now she's doing a sexual dance with the intentions to arouse sexually Herod, instructed by her mother, and said, when he is aroused, he, because I know him, he is going to grant you whatever your request is. And when he does, tell him, I want the head of John the Baptist. I want that preacher that you've been holding in jail, that, that Bible thumper, that self-righteous guy. You know how they talk about us. That preacher who thinks he's holier than thou. You know, that kind, of, you know, that kind of preacher that we can't stand. We like the Pharisees. We like the scribes. We like the Sadducees because they don't bother anybody. They're just nice. But that John, that him, come telling us how we should live. Who is he? To tell me who I can sleep with and who I can't sleep with. Who made him God? Not God, but he was the forerunner of Jesus Christ. And he was right. And surely enough, that girl danced. I don't know what kind of uh, music they were playing that day. But she danced. She, oh boy, she, woo, woo, woo. And surely enough, oh Herod, 
got aroused. And surely enough, he asked a question, and she told him what she wanted. And the Bible teaches that he regretted that decision, but he had to go through with it. And, and that is the unceremonious way that the mighty John the Baptist lost his life. The mighty forerunner of Jesus Christ died that way. Verse 13 says, when Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by ship into a desert place apart. And when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the city. Jesus left. The uproar is on about John's beheading. The people followed Jesus. Verse 14 says, And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude. And look at, look at our Lord. Having just lost his cousin and forerunner, when he saw the needs of the multitude, the Bible says he was moved with compassion toward them. And look at this. And he healed their sick. Isn't that amazing? Hearts, his heart is broken. Mother Marshall here went to be alone. It's good to see you. And, 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 but he saw the needs of the people. And the Bible says in verse 15, and when evening, and when it was evening, see, notice in the text, in verse 15, it says, and when it was evening, and in verse 23, it says, and when it was evening. The Jews had the evening time. They had two evenings in Jewish time. The early evening was from three to 5 p.m. We would call it afternoon. Late evening uh, was from 6 to 9. So between 3 and uh, between 3 and 6, I said 3 and 5, between 3 and 6, early evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a desert place and the time is now past. His disciples sound like my Armor bearers and security do from time to time. Lord, ain't nowhere out here to eat, and we've been out here all day. We are ready to go. Send the multitude away that they may go into the villages and buy them some victuals. They need to go and get them something to eat. Now, Lord, you didn't heal. We're tired. <laughs> But Jesus said unto them, I mean, they didn't expect this response. They need not depart. Give ye them to eat. Send them away so they can get their own food. Jesus said they ain't got to go nowhere. You feed them. What? <laughs> and, they, and they said unto him, um, we have... We don't, we don't have anybody. We, we only got two fish and five loaves. And Jesus says, is that all? He said, yes. He said, bring them to me. And the feeding of the 5,000 is the miracle that is recorded in all of the Gospels. And so Jesus said, bring them to me. Thank you, Lord. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass and took five loaves and two fish. And some people say fishes, and two fish, and, uh, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke and gave the loaves to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. What a miracle of multiplication. And they did eat and were filled and they, they took up the fragments that remained 12 baskets. You know, the Jews, the way they lived then, it was not uncommon for a Jewish person to have a basket with them. So they you commandeered the people's empty baskets, and Jesus, he fed them so much, he gave them such an abundance that there were 12 baskets full remaining. And they, isn't that amazing? And, and, and they had... They that had eaten were about 5,000 men 
beside the women and children, easily 20 to 25,000 people. It was after feeding this huge crowd, still having heard about the death of John, still hadn't had time to grieve on that. Jesus constrains his disciples to get into the ship and go over to the other side. I want you to sail across the sea here. And uh, they, they didn't want to go. They didn't want to leave him. They didn't want to leave him. They didn't want to, to leave him. And, and, and it could be because they were still, they hadn't quite gotten, hadn't quite gotten over of what happened the last time they were out at sea. Yeah, nothing like a bad voyage to make you not want to do it again. Chapter 8 of Matthew's Gospel, verse 23 says, And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves. But he was asleep. And his disciples came to him and awoke him and said, Lord, save us, we perish. And he said unto them, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose, rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. But the men marvel, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the waves obey him? And that's something. Only problem is, you know, the last time that happened, you were on the ship with us. This time, you're trying to send us by ourselves. If you're going to sail with us, you know, I'm, I'm, down, I'm down. But now, Lord, if you're going to stay here, I really don't want to go back out there because it was rough out there. And the only thing that got us through was your being on board. And Jesus said, no, you got to go. Can you see Jesus and the disciples arguing? And our Lord prevails. And so they reluctantly get into the ship. And uh, then he says to the multitude, look, y'all go home. Dinner's over. This restaurant's closing. You have food enough. You got, you got food left over. And the, and the crowd didn't want to go because they did not want to go back to Herod Antipas territory. Man living with his brother's wife. Messed up daughter. And they didn't kill John the Baptist. And there's all kinds of hostilities. And we've just had a great revival. And all of this healing. And you healed us. And you fed us. And you blessed us. And now you're trying to dismiss us. You can tell that crowd wasn't like this crowd because you'd be happy if I dismissed you right now. <laughs> yeah, so they, they didn't want, that'll preach right there, the crowd, the church that didn't want a benediction. <laughs> they did not want to dismiss service. They didn't want to leave Jesus. And so he made them go. And uh, I'm almost done. And when uh, he had sent the multitude away, he went into a mountain apart to pray. Here's the second one. And when evening was now come, between 6 and 9 p.m., when evening was now come, he was there alone. Finally, finally, by himself. The key to Jesus' public ministry and power was that he knew how to retire and spend time alone with God. Mark chapter 4 verse 10 says, And when he was alone, they that were about him with 12 baskets asked of him a parable. Mark 6 and 47 says, And when evening was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he was alone. 
Luke's gospel, chapter 9 and verse 18 says, And it came to pass, as he was alone praying, his disciples were with him. John's gospel, chapter 6 and verse 15 says, When Jesus therefore perceived that they were come to take him by force, to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. We need to spend more time in retirement from the world in prayer and meditation with God. We do not have enough alone time. The cell phones, fix it where not every, you, you're accessible all the time. Most believers are suffering from spiritual burnout because the key to our strength is what we do when we're not standing here. You need to be somewhere Alone. To this day, I miss living in Rockingham. There's very few things I miss about it, but the one thing that I do miss is the trips that I used to take from Raleigh to Rockingham and from Rockingham to Raleigh, riding in the car, pre-cell phone days, and when they, found, when they did come out, they were so expensive. I had one in the car, but I couldn't afford to use it. And you'd ride two hours one way alone. Oftentimes, my wife and family couldn't make the trip alone. Time to pray. Time to think. Time to, to communicate with the Lord. Not, not, we don't spend enough time alone. Most of us, we call each other for nothing. We, we assume that alone time is not important time. The late, great Dr. Billy Graham was asked, if you could live your life over, what would you do differently? I got on the edge of my seat to hear his answer. I thought, Judge, he would preach more uh, crusades. I thought maybe he would write more books. I thought maybe he would say, I would preach uh, more sermons. His, his answer was, I would have spent more time alone with God. I would have spent more time alone with my Bible, with God. The key to staying saved, the key to longevity in God, the key to keeping your spirits high, the key from keeping from being turned into a pessimist, the key uh, from to not Falling asleep is knowing how to manage your time alone with God. Praise the Lord. Uh, the, the robocall industry is the devil. They know how to just call, 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 call. Bzz, 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 phone, phone constantly buzzing or constantly ringing. Call. It's, it is to interfere with your time alone. You got to fight to get alone with God. When the Lord said to Joshua on three occasions in chapter one, be strong and very courageous, be strong and very courageous, be strong and very courageous, the context of each admonition was to keep the word before you, to read the Bible. It takes strength. Life won't just let you have time to study. Life and obligations won't just allow you to have time alone with God. You have to be strong. You have to make it a priority. You have to do what you have to do. It's going to cost you some of your TV shows. It's going to cost you some of your social time. It's going to cost you. You may not be able to keep up with all of the latest gossip. I'll tell you what, the more time you spend alone with God, the, more in, the less interested, interesting you will find those things. Jesus was finally alone. I feel my help. And uh, once he had gotten alone, the Jews uh, divided the evening into three periods of 
six hours. Talk to you about that. Jesus was up there, but the scene shifts from the mountain where Christ is alone with the Father to the sea where the disciples were out on the ocean in obedience to Jesus Christ. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea. That will preach right there. Because some people believe that if you're walking in God's obedience, no trouble will happen. Well, here, here, here they are obeying God, and they're in a storm. Because Jesus was the one who sent them out there. So it, it can't be that they had sinned. Praise the Lord. The ship was caught in the storm. In the Bible, there are two kinds of storms. There are the storms of correction when God is disciplining us. Then there are storms of perfection when God is helping us grow. This was a storm of perfection. Stop assuming that every storm that comes your way is God disciplining you. Sometimes God allows things to grow us, to take us from where we are to where we need to be. He uses the storms of life. Yes, sir, they were caught up in a storm. And uh, notice this. The Bible teaches that they were caught up in the storm, tossed with the waves, for the winds were contrary. If you look at John chapter 6 right quick, oh, Rocky, come on. The upper room's getting tired of me. They're ready to go home and celebrate Christmas. This is good preaching here. John the uh, sixth the chapter. I want to show you something. And the 19th uh, verse tells us that so when they had rolled, look at this, about 5 to 20 furlongs. That is 3 to 5 miles. They were halfway of the journey. They were out there caught up in a storm. They were tired. They'd been rowing. And uh, I just told you, that the time is between 6 p.m. and 9 p.m. Between 6 and 9, Jesus is praying. The disciples are in a storm. And the wind is contrary. And verse 25 tells us that and in the fourth watch of the night, went Jesus unto them. What, what, what's your point, uh, Bishop? Well, Jesus didn't move right away. When he saw them in the storm, he didn't come to them. Jesus noticed that they were struggling out there, and he didn't act. Lord have mercy. Somebody's struggling. <laughs> yes. The Jews divided the night into three parts of uh, four hours. From 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. This was the fourth watch. But from 6 to 9 was the first watch. From 9 to 12 was the third, the second watch. From 12 to 3 was the third watch. And from 3 to 6 a.m. was the fourth watch. So Jesus waits until the fourth watch. That means that the disciples had been at sea struggling by now for at least nine hours. Battling the storm. Trying to get to the other side. Some of you have been battling for about nine hours. Glory to God. Some of you have been battling six hours. Somebody else five. Jesus sees you. He knows where you are. From a geographical standpoint, it was not humanly possible for Jesus to be able to see them. He's on a mountain. They're out in the sea. The storm, the clouds, you can't see. But yet God knew where they were. I want you to know the Lord sees where you are. He knows where you are. Somebody's asking the Lord, Lord, do you see my situation? Of course he does. He saw it before you did. 
Of course he saw, and uh, but he moves when he deems the time is right. We used to sing, you can't hurry God. But with God, you just got to wait. You got to trust him and give him time, no matter how long it takes. With God, you can't hurry. He will be there. Now, don't worry, but he may not come when you want him but he's right on time. See, sometimes we, we try to tell God when to do it, how to do it, and what time to do it. The Lord determines when, how, praise the Lord, and what time. And so Jesus looks out at them and sees them struggling and see them struggling and see them struggling and Jesus goes back to praying to the Father. And he lets them struggle and let them struggle. Jesus said, I'm letting them, I'm, I'm letting them build their spiritual muscles. But they need this spiritual exercise anyway. That's what they get for making me argue. Perhaps had they went out there when I told them to, they probably could have missed the storm. But, but I think I'll leave them out there a little while longer. But when, when, when the storm got uh, too bad and when uh, their exhaustion was all, their energy was all but gone. Jesus told the father, I gotta leave you now. I've got to go down and see about my children. And so Jesus, in the fourth watch of the night, closes the prayer between three and six a.m. in the morning and began, he goes down to the shore, shore, the shore and there is no boat, no boat, Jesus said, no problem. And he began to walk on the water. It wasn't a smooth walk because the winds were contrary. Jesus would walk up one wave and down another and around another. Water all around him. The waves would lift him up and the waves would let him down. But he kept on walking. Oh Lord, and out there on that sea where there are no land markers, there's no big tree to turn past, there's no gully to go down. Water looks like water in the dark of the night. Jesus begins to walk on the water, going out there. I'm glad that he knows where we are. He sees everything. The Hebrew writer said, neither is there any creature that is not manifested in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto his eyes, of whom the eyes of him of whom we have to do. Jesus sees everything. Proverbs 15 and three says, the eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. So Jesus walked out there three miles or so in all that deep water and he found them and look at God. When they saw him walking, they did exactly what I would have done. They cried out, they screamed because they thought they had seen a ghost. They never seen a man walk on water. Who would expect to see somebody out there in the midst of a storm? You've been rowing all night long. You've been rowing for at least nine hours. The storm is bad. Your body is tired. You've gone as far as you can go. And then you look out and here comes a man walking on the water. And the thing about it, it wasn't that one of them saw him. The Bible said they all saw him. They thought it was a phantasm. They thought it was a ghost. They thought it was a spirit. They thought it was something evil. And they cried. But I'm glad that even though life can frighten you, there is something in life that will always bring calm to the child of God. Many things can give us fear, 
but there's always something that would bring calm to the child of God. What is that thing? Brother, turn me up here, please, sir. What is that thing that will bring calm to the child of God? I'll tell you what it is. It's the voice of the Savior. It's the Word of God. Have you ever been in a situation and you almost fell apart, but you heard the Lord whisper in your ear and say, I got you. Have you ever been in a place where you're about to panic, but the spirit of peace came all over you? Have you ever been down? Uh, and it felt like you couldn't go any further but you went to church that day and you heard the word of God well they were struggling they thought they'd seen a ghost but there was one thing that was unmistakable that was one thing that they couldn't get wrong John chapter 10 said the sheep know the voice of that shepherd and when Jesus said it is I be not afraid hallelujah they knew that voice do I have anybody here who knows the voice of the Lord if you know his voice you ought to praise him because you know his voice If you really know his voice, if you really, 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 and you've really heard it where at a time where you need to hear it, can you praise him like you know it? Hallelujah. 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 He said, this is I. Be not afraid. And the thing about it is, according to Mark's gospel, Jesus only went out there Sister Moses to give him the word because Mark chapter 6 and verse 48 says and he saw them toiling and rowing and the way and the wind was contrary to them and about the fourth watch of the night hallelujah he came out and Mark said walking on the sea and Mark said and he would have passed them by he would have kept going because all they really needed was a word from the Lord. Do I have anybody here who can say all I really need is a word from the Lord? Hallelujah. He don't have to fix it today, but if I can just get a word that will tell me after a while everything will be all right. I'll take that word and I'll shout on that word. They got a word from the Lord. The word said, be of good cheer. Fear has got to go. It is I. Be not afraid. The Lord told me to tell you, be of good cheer and be not afraid because Jesus is with us. The same Jesus who kept us all year will keep us into the new year the same jesus who took you through the death of your mother the death of your father took you through cancer brought you through tough times that same jesus is saying today be of good cheer be not afraid it is i ah yes sir so jesus he gave them the word and the truth is, when they got the word, fear left. How do I know that fear left? How do I know that the situation changed? I know it based on what Peter said. Peter said to him, he said, Law, if it be you, the if there is not if as in questioning. But it's if, as in since, since it's you, since it's you, would you please be so kind to let me come to you? 
sense is you. See, I'm safer on the water with Jesus than in the ship without Jesus. I'd rather be on the water where Jesus is than to be on the ship where Jesus is not. So Jesus senses you. I know I can't come unless you invite me, unless you command me for whomever God commands, God enables. If he commands you to do a thing, he'll enable you to do that thing. So Jesus, recognizing that Peter had faith and that the fear was gone, Jesus said to Peter, come. Peter said, what? He said, come. The next thing I know, he's climbing out the ship. Come, I'm, y'all, I'm going. Climbing out. Getting down. Getting out the ship. Getting down. Step, 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 step down. On that water. Woo! The others are looking. Jesus is over there. And guess what? The storm is still beating down. And there he is on the water. Do I have anybody out here who is on the water? Yeah! Oh, Lord. When you're walking by faith, you're living on the water. You're walking on the water. So Peter begins to walk. Good God Almighty. On the water. On his way to Jesus Christ. And the truth is, he wasn't trying to be spectacular. He was just trying to get to Jesus. See, there's a difference between trying to be spectacular and trying to get to Jesus. The only way he could get to Jesus was to walk on the water. Wasn't trying to be a star. And so he walks on the water. But while walking, he did what we do. He began to pay attention to pre-existing conditions. It was raining before Jesus got there. It was storming before Jesus got there. The wind was blowing before Jesus got there. But when Jesus got there, he took his mind off all that stuff and began to look at Jesus. But once he began to go to Jesus, somehow he began to pay attention to his environment. How many of you did run well but now I'm back at the beginning. Who did hinder you? What, what caught your eye? Or who caught your eye? And it pulled you away from Jesus. Broke your concentration. You went from a single-minded pursuit to having two ways. He saw Jesus two ways. And he saw the stone. And the moment he began to pay attention to the stone, he began to sink. He began to sink. But thank God he didn't lose his mind. When he began to sink, he cried out to the Lord. Hallelujah. He cried out. And he said, Lord, help me. Help me, Lord. And Jesus immediately, immediately, right then and there, Jesus saved him. And then he asked the question. He said, oh, ye of little faith. Little faith. Little faith. What's little? You know, the Bible says, if you faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small, small there, narrow. 
See, some of us can believe God 100% in some areas and won't believe him at all in others. You can trust him over here with this. You can trust him. I've seen people who could trust God to heal them of cancer and they got healed, but they couldn't trust God to sow $1,000 in the work of the Lord. Say, I can't see doing that. But you could believe him to heal you. I've seen people who could trust God to stand in the face of all kinds of adversity, but couldn't trust God to keep them out of immorality. He had enough faith. He had perfect faith. He had faith to get him out of the boat, to walk, faith to even make the request, to get out of the ship, to walk on the water. But then it proved not to be enough faith to get him to Jesus. And the good thing is now, when his faith failed him, Jesus made up the difference. I'm glad of that. And then Jesus says to him, I know, and I'm going to pray after this, I know that you've been toiling for nine hours. I know that you guys are dog tired. I know that you're as wet as can be. I know that you've never been in a situation like this before. I know that tonight you've been scared out of your wits. I know that you've had pressure on you tonight like nobody's business. I can only imagine, I know the things that ran through your mind when you thought to yourself, the only reason we're out here is because Jesus sent us out here. And after we obeyed him, look at what has happened. I know all of these things were in your mind. He says, but I still have a question. Why'd you doubt? How many situations, how many points can you bring up about your life? Lord, this is wrong. Or that. Or this. I've been through the other. All these things. And the Lord will look at you and say, all those things you're saying is true. But I have a question for you. Why are you doubting me? Have I not proven to you that no matter how complex your life is, but if you trust me, I can still straighten it out. The question implies that there was no justifying reason. There was no justification. None for him to doubt Jesus. Yeah, but, but Pastor, you, you don't know. I, 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 can, I, I have a slew of things. The Lord will hear your slew and then ask you, why do you doubt me? Why would you doubt? Do you believe that I can do this? And Jesus took him up and took him and brought him to the ship. And the moment they, Jesus got on board, the storm ceased. And they went from being in a storm at sea to, according to the text, it became a worship service. It became a church service. They began to worship the Lord, saying, truly, you're the son of God. They began to worship him out there, still on that same sea, halfway there. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Somebody today has had some complexing things that happened to them. Some difficult things. Some shortcomings. Some disappointments. Things have happened. You're shaking you a little bit. But today's message is one that's designed to bring you back in full faith. Full assurance to trusting the God of the Bible. That he will see you through that he will keep you, Hallelujah. 
that he will enable you. Come to the altar. My faith have been shaken. Hallelujah. My faith have been shaken. Hallelujah. I want to believe God like I used to. See, sometimes the Lord sends storms because we put too much faith in our narratives that we construct. We construct them. And we, and, and, and we don't mean harm now. If I do this, if I do right by this, if I obey God, then God ain't going to let this happened to me. And I have confidence in that. So I'm going to do right. So that the unthinkable will not happen to me. And, and I'm going to live my life by that. And you know what the Lord will do? He will honor that until it's time to grow your faith. Then you know what he does? He lets the unthinkable happen. And when you get shaken, he says, why are you doubting me? Well, Lord, I did this, this, and this. And you still let this happen. I sure did. Faith only grows when it is challenged. When it is stretched. When you move into the realm of the unfamiliar. And there's something else. God's growing you. Anytime you're going through it, you say, my God, this is something else. God's growing you. That's right. That's right. You don't grow till you move into the realm uh, right. of the something else. Right. See, any of us can act and serve him in the realm of the familiar. Praise the Lord. But oh God, today, 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 before the new year comes in today before my time runs out today. I want my faith renewed in Jesus. I've just received this letter. I don't know if it happened today or just now or what. Brother Robert Celso's dad is in ICU after having two strokes. Did he just have them? He is on life support. Father, we pray for Brother Celso's dad. We pray for him. We pray for him. We pray for him, Lord. We pray for him. And we ask you, oh God, to perform a miracle <clears throat> on his behalf. Perform a miracle on his behalf. Perform a miracle. Ask you, oh God, to turn the situation. We ask you, oh God, to stay the hand of death. We pray for a miracle of healing in Jesus' name. Thank God. Amen. Everybody on the altar, lift your hands to the Lord. God, the Holy Spirit is about to renew your faith if you want it renewed. Now, here's what he won't do. He won't fight you to renew your faith. But he'll let you renew your faith. I believe you, Lord. Oh, God, I believe you. Somebody's going to walk on the water. <clears throat> God's going to bless you to walk and live and serve in the realm of the supernatural. God is going to do it. In the name of Jesus. Father, right now. I pray for these who are on the altar. 
We ask you, O oh, Heavenly Father, O oh, Heavenly Father, we ask you right now, God, to touch every heart, touch every soul, touch every man, woman, boy, and girl, touch the young, touch the old, touch those who have gone through, and oh God, renew their faith, renew their faith in the name of Jesus. Oh God, hallelujah. We, we're, we're moving from disbelief to belief. We're going from little faith to big faith. In the name of Jesus, we're moving, Lord, from, from trusting you to move in one area to asking you, oh God, to move in every area. In the name of Jesus. Oh God, you're able to do it. You're able to do it. Heal, oh Jesus. Hallelujah. Let everything work out the way that it's supposed to. In the name of the Lord, be made whole, young lady. In Jesus' name, God, touch her right now. Oh, Jesus, the devil is a liar. The Lord build your faith. The Lord build your faith. Tell him, I believe. I believe in the name of Jesus in the name of the Lord oh God this young man hallelujah get him oh God to fight for what is right give him wisdom knowledge and understanding to outwit the devil Satan the Lord rebuke you you can't have him we declare that he's God's property in the name of Jesus work it out Lord Work it out, Lord. Don't let him get distracted. Don't let him get pulled. Make him wise to the devil's tricks, to the devil's antics in the name of Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, do it, Lord. Do it for your glory. Do it for your honor in the name of Jesus. Lord, revive this young lady. I come against the enemy. I come against the devil. Need in the name of Jesus. Touch, oh God. Touch Jesus. Touch Jesus. Somebody ought to help me pray. Touch Jesus, make a way, Lord. You know what you need. You know what you need. She been out there on the ocean sailing. Jesus, come to her rescue. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Lord, I thank you. Lord, I thank you. Revive right now. Revive right now. Hey. Touch him right now, Lord. Do it in his heart. I wish I had a praying church. Do it in his mind. In the name of Jesus, touch this young lady. Touch your old God. Touch your mother. Touch your marriage. Touch your baby. Touch her. Ah, revive. Revive a soul. Revive a heart. Revive a mind. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah. Somebody praise the Lord. Somebody praise the Lord. Bless this young man, Lord. Bless this young brother. In the name of Jesus.
saved you today? Yes, sir. You accept Christ? Yes, sir. Somebody ought to praise him for accepting Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 If I had a good worker to keep him on fire, bless the Lord. Let her faith grow. Somebody ought to shout, I'm growing in my faith. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. Hallelujah. I'm taking my eyes off of what's not right. Put my eyes back on Jesus. Put my eyes back on the Lord. In the name of Jesus. Lord, I believe. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory, 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 glory. Mother, be made whole. The Lord make you whole. Jesus, 
Hallelujah. Y'all moving too slow. God bless this young lady in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, God. Faith is growing. My faith is growing. I believe my God can do anything. My God can do anything. Ah, my God can do anything. Yes, he can. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Somebody ought to praise him. This is our last service of the day. Hallelujah. Oh, oh, Lord. Hallelujah. My faith is growing. My faith is growing. My faith is growing. My faith is growing. If your faith is growing, give God praise right now. If your faith is growing, you're to thank him. Faith is growing. Thank you, Jesus. Bless the Lord. Bless her. Bless, bless, bless. Set, set these young folk on fire. Do it in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Oh! Bless him, bless him, bless him, bless him. Bless him, Lord. Bless, bless, oh God, bless. Woo! Glory to God. Uh, come on, upper room. Let's praise Jesus. Let's praise Jesus. Let's praise Jesus. Praise him. Can you feel his anointing? Can you feel his presence? Can you feel his power? Glory, glory, glory. 